But without further ado, I'm going to go over this Make It Juicy presentation. Easy ways to make your game more engaging. A presentation by me. So, hi everyone. My name is Tara Mia. Everyone knows me. Let's move forward. <laughs> um, people on the stream probably don't know me. Now you know me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, this um, was a presentation I actually made for the Unity um, interest group. But that's besides the point. What we're going to talk about is this term called juice. Juice is a kind of a feedback that makes a, feed power, uh, that makes a player feel more powerful and in control by signifying how they are doing per interaction, as per defined by Kyle Gray, Kyle Gabler, Shalon Shodan, and uh, Shalon Shodan, and Matt Kukic. By the way, that is a paraphrasing. I think I wrote that definition, but that's besides the point. The, the point still stands that juice is about feedback, visual feedback, auditory feedback, so on and so actually won is Krita, but as of right now, it was a little difficult to schedule an instructor for that. So this is currently a replacement for it, but our next lesson plan is currently planned to be Krita. We'll probably let you know more information. We uh, <laughs> right, when we, uh, we'll get back to you on when we have more information about that plan. I don't think anybody's going to be critical of you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, if anyone isn't aware, Krita is an open source um, Photoshop-like application where you create a lot of uh, images and graphics for it. It actually has quite an extensive set of features, including uh, one functionality for tileable, uh, tileable textures. So those are a couple of random features I'd like to know more in detail about. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why it's in there. Anyways, let's talk about juice. Sorry about that, I had to kind of sigu and make sure that we address that. So our first game, we are going to basically play Flappy Bird, or Flappy Fly, Flappy Fly. It's not a clone, I swear. I made a game called It's Not a Clone. Actually, it's, the full title is just Not a Clone, but anyways. So anyways, this is Flappy Fly. Um, especially if you're kind of familiar with high school or middle school video game projects, this is usually kind of the place where I personally end up starting in, as well, whether it be in game jams or whatnot, where um, we have this game here where, you know, it's, it's kind of slow. I'm tapping really, like, I can tap a lot and I won't go very high. And these slow moving pillars are, you know, very slow moving and so forth. You know, overall great game, 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10, great stuff. But we're gonna make that better. So the first thing I usually like to do is actually make the action, or make the action that you're doing a lot more um, impactful. And, the, and so as an example, uh, one thing that immediately strikes me when playing this game is the fact that when I tap, I don't go very high, right? I go like maybe uh, maybe one twentieth the height of the screen. So that will be like the first thing I want to change to kind of make it so that whatever swing, whatever sword swing you're doing, or whatever jump you're doing, that it feels grand. It feels grand. It feels magnificent. It feels big and awesome. So we're gonna make it so that every time I tap, like I go up nearly a fourth of the screen instead of one twentieth of the screen as before. And to compensate for that, I also made the gravity like ridiculously high. So, you know, Earth's gravity is negative 9.81 uh, meters per second. And here, I, huh? Meters per second squared. Meters per second squared, correct. Um, but here, what I instead did was uh, I switched it up to negative 40 meters per, meters per second squared. So now like, 
you, th you know, this looks like how Mario normally falls, but when you actually calculate it, you'll notice that is faster, much faster than a rock would actually fall in real life. So, to me, like, that actually makes the game a little more fun, that, you know, that I'm tapping this and I'm covering significantly more ground. It also means that I have to tap less. So the fact that less button presses get me more uh, leverage out of it is, you know, one way of making your game feel much more reactive. Now, granted, uh, okay, so the next part is, so obviously the pillars move really, really slowly. So let's make that also very much faster. So here it is. Here's the pillars coming in a lot faster. See? We got to action. Yeah! So this is already looking a lot better than before. I mean, compare that to this. It's a pretty big difference. <laughs> um, so yeah, generally speaking, you want to make sure that you're getting... Uh, so obviously, like this whole beginning moment here, you want to make sure that the player has a handle of the controls, but you want to make sure that they get into the bulk of the action of the game as soon as possible. So, like, um, you know, there's a little bit of tutorial on how to figure out what the controls is, and then BAM! Some disaster happened. Go now, hero. You gotta do your heroics. Something like that. Um, applicable, I think, also to writing. Applicable, I think, also to pretty much every other medium. You want to make sure that you get, the fun, you get to the fun places sooner rather than later. Because you want to make sure that you hook them within that five minutes that they have. Let there be sound! Yeah! Sound effects! Huge! Huge! I cannot emphasize this enough. Huge! So, um, <clears throat> sound is awesome. You gotta make sure that you have your sound effects in there. Um, it's very, 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 very easy to find games and kind of think to yourself, wow, this is really amateur if they have no sound effects whatsoever. So, um, just adding sound alone tends to add a lot to the game. So already, like now, I said earlier that you know, whenever you tap, I want to make sure that that feels like you have an impact. But this, now you have sound effects. It's amazing. It's like, wow, I'm actually doing something now. And I'm also going through the ground. Yes, question. Why don't your floor and ceiling move during gameplay, but they do? I'll get, get to that later. All right. <laughs> So yeah, add sound effects. But, if you kind of listen to this, it's a little monotonous, right? It's like the same sound effect going on again, 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 again. And people are going to notice this, uh, especially if the game is bad, although even if the game is good, I, I would argue people will notice this. Um, like, the fact that the same sound effect is playing makes it easy for players to get bored. So, what if, instead, we randomized the pitch of that sound effect? Sounds a little better, right? So actually when you're kind of playing this game, it adds a lot more variety to how you know, each flat feels. And that's important. You want to make sure that you're giving a little bit of variety each time a uh, person is playing through the game. So make sure that you actually randomize the pitch of the sound effect. This is, if you're a programmer, super duper easy to do. If you're not a programmer, I can tell you how to do it in Unity. I open source that code, so I'll be more than happy to tell you where that information is. Uh, for this purpose, I randomize the pitch between 0 0.5 and 1.5. So that, those are percentages, by the way, 50% and 150%. So uh, it just toggles between a random number between those and uh, just kind of plays the sound effects in that specific pitch. Like I said, this goes a very long way. I mean, you can hear it in the flaps, but you can also hear it in like more rudimentary sound effects, like me hitting on that ground. That, act that sound effect is also randomized as well. So now, not only is every flap different, but every depth is now different as well. Most sound audio designers, when you work with them, will actually ask you how many different variations of sound effects you want to add per action. Generally speaking, I aim for uh, three or four.
for any action that is very repetitive. Like if you're going to be swinging your sword a lot, then you know the more the better. So why not make it at you know three, four, five, six ish, and kind of randomly choose between one of those sound effects. Because again, you want to make sure that the player feels like some um, that the game is not monotonous. That something very new is going on each time they're playing. <coughs> Music. Music is huge, you know. I mean, it's just see, it's amazing already. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> All right, so that did not work out as well as I thought. But you know, just adding music alone is an easy, very easy way to create a more epic atmosphere. In this case, I chose "Call to Adventure" by Kevin McLeod, um, which you can kind of listen here which obviously is a very epic sounding music, but um, the important part is music is a fantastic tool to set the mood for the game. And more often than not, it's usually help it's helpful to add something like that. Even for like, you know, uh, sort of like a narrative based game, having even ambient sound effects allows you to contextualize the action that you're in. So as much as possible, you want to flesh out the world that you're giving to your, uh, world that you're giving to your game in your application. So music does like a fantastic job of delivering that specific promise. All right, so so far we've been talking about audio. What about, uh, what about making things actually scroll? So earlier we have this, hi Clue, thanks for joining in. Uh, earlier we had, you know, Jace asking this important question, of why the heck is the background as well as the top and the bottom place not moving? You are absolutely correct. A lot of people are going to ask that question too. So why not fix that by actually having that moving? <laughs> yeah! See? It's on a loop. Huh? It just <laughs> it's on a loop, yes. Um, what's important about the whole background scrolling uh, scrolling thing actually is you want to make sure that you have like the even the background feel like there's some there's some sort of interaction going on there's some sort of action going on as well because the background is as much as part of the world as any so like in, whereas in this case where it just it genuinely feels like it's just a pillars are you know out to get you <laughs> now now you have this game where you're like oh you're traveling forward Which is which is different, right? It feel that feels a little that feels like the objective is a little more fair, I guess. But it makes it, it makes it clear what's happening. It, it recontextualizes the action you're taking, and that's important. Uh, that I would argue is important. Animations, animations is huge. In the next set of games, I'm gonna ask you to figure out what kind of animations I added in. So let's do a little bit of an I Spy game here. So everyone ready? Remember this was what we started with. Right? So here's it with animations. <laughs> okay, so far what's different? Somebody? Yeah, it's, I added in a little bit of an angle based off of the velocity, it's tra a vertical velocity, it's traveling. So already, again, you're getting a little more context. You're getting a little more uh, feed, visual feedback as to what happens every time you tap. Oh no! What was it? Okay, what else did I add in there? The uh, stalactites and stalactites react to the bouncing Yep, correct. And there's one more thing I added in. Physics? This one's a little subtle. Um, let me. Whoops. Oh, let me lie. I didn't mean to do that. Correct. Um, I think I know what Anthony means. So it used to be that Flappy Fly would just get stuck on that pillar once you uh, hit it. But in this new version, I'm going to choose here. You know, Flappy Fly now actually falls down on the ground, contextualizing the, that death. 
So even in that sequence, you want to make sure that you're adding a little bit of animation to it. Uh, generally speaking, animation is a great way to kind of evoke the impact of the action that you're making. So as an example, you can kind of subtly see every time I'm tapping that the flappy fly actually flaps its wings. But because now I'm angling it based off of vertical velocity, it's now even more pronounced that, he's act that the character's actually flapping its wings because it visually looks like it's moving on an upward trajectory, therefore making it look like that flap was a lot more powerful. Likewise, hitting the stalactites, uh, stalagmites and stalactites, uh, that wiggling, that's me just having a little bit of fun. Um, I know stalactites and stalagmites doesn't really do that, but there's actually a good other, another good reason why you'd want to do that. Anything that sort of, you know, has some sort of interactive value to it, whether it be, you know, a key that you can carry, a door that you can interact with, a door that you can open, or, uh, you know, a bunch of thorns that if you fall, on, fall into, you're going to die on. Usually it's a good idea to have some sort of visual change on those to make it clear that there are interactable things. To contrast that with other things that you cannot interact with. So as an example, uh, you, can't, you cannot interact, oh, I apparently broke the game. <laughs> uh, you can interact, you cannot interact with the ceiling, right? You just bounce off of it. Also, you go past it, but that's besides the point. Um, but like, that, that's a contrast. You, you're saying to, uh, that creates a visual language saying that, oh, there are things in this world that I can interact with um, even if what I'm doing right now doesn't actually amount to anything, if say you have a door that requires a key, if either one, the door suddenly starts talking to you that you need a key, or two, it shows like a symbol of a key, or three, it just, wig it just shakes a little and laughs at you or something. Like, those are all critical information. They're giving you clues that the, you, that door is openable. It's a door, you can open it, because some games, doors don't open. But in this case, you know, you want to make sure that in doing so, you're telling the player that something can be done with that door and something can be, uh, there is a puzzle to solve. So that's just an example of that. All right, particle effects. Too bad Patrick is not here, but particle effects are huge too. Let's just add a ton of them. See, I've added a, like, I've added one, uh, two new particle effects here. Let's see if anyone can name it. Anyone? The Tinkerbell. Yeah, fairy dust. So the Tinkerbell fairy dust happens every time you flap. <coughs> and then the trail is there. Oh yeah, you also explode. That's important. <laughs> and the trail is there. Huh? The trail is kind of there to kind of indicate um, your path. So... <laughs> So generally speaking, my policy with particle effects, uh, more usually is good, but I personally like to focus on particle effects that actually gives you added amount of information. So for example, in this case, the tracing particle effects is actually quite significant because it tells you what your arc looks like. It tells you what your previous actions path looks like, and that's more information to the player so that they can more readily figure out the physics of this character and thus be able to play better as a consequence of it. Uh, the Tinkerbell the fairy dust are more about you know being able to know when you actually flap. Um, I do think you know that making that more reactive, giving more uh, visual obvious feedback to say like, hey, uh, flapping actually did something you know, kind of gives more impact to that action and makes it more clear um, to the player that, um, you know, they, they actually tap and the game has actually registered that tap. As for it burning, that's just me having fun. Uh, you know, you might as well make death be like a significant event. So my, like, my favorite thing to do is just make the player explode. So, yeah. Be like a... Darn, the name escapes me. Director of Transformers. 
Michael Bay. Yeah, be like Michael Bay when it comes to particle effects. Figure out a way to uh, make things look like they're exploding. <laughs> make it windy. All right, so what I did was I added in some uh, leaves in the background. Uh, I actually had more in mind with this uh, in that the leaves would actually bounce off of the Flappy Fly if you just move that, but that was really hard to program, so I didn't do that. Anyways, what I need to say is, um, you know, adding more action to the background, but even making the background ever so slightly interactive is also like a really huge um, improvement in the feedback factor, in, you know. Because you want to make sure that, yeah, like I said, every single action that you take feels that much more impactful, that much more um, int visually interesting, auditorily interesting, and more invigorating to the senses. Uh, so adding physics. This is usually my favorite formula. So, so far we've been passing through those pillars and they just kind of wiggled at you. So that's great and all, but personally, I think we can do one better than that. Uh, I like to use a lot of physics in my game, and by that, I mean something like this. So, I think actually the uh, stalactite still wiggle at you if you hit it. Let me check. Yeah, it still does that. Never mind. So, um... <coughs> I don't know if you've seen games do this, but like, you know, if you kill an enemy, they just kind of fall apart like that. Like, that's a really cool thing to see. And it's actually fairly cheap and easy to do for a lot of modelers, you know, uh, programmers and so forth. Because now you're just letting the physics engine do the job. And so that's really the reason why a lot of people do it. But also because this gives you the extra satisfaction of getting, in, getting the new score each time. So now you feel like a little more accomplished at Yes? Did you pre-cut those sprites in that way, or is there a script that just uh, cuts it in a grid that looks very grid-like? I, I pre-cut them, um, largely out of laziness. <laughs> <coughs> camera shakes. These are huge. So camera shake. Oh. So does that mean this, there's a bunch of little sprites now instead of one large sprite? Yes. You grouped as a you group together? Yes. Okay. Correct. So what's actually going on is that So these are just single sprites, but as soon as you walk past them, I replace them with the multi sprites. By the way, this game is open source, feel free to uh, check it out. You can also find it at Game Jolt. I should have probably started out started out with that, but then never mind. Um, <clears throat> so that's me adding physics. Uh, but camera shakes, this is huge. It's super subtle. Most people don't notice it. But camera, uh, anytime you shake the camera, uh, usually that adds just that much more impact to the game. It's probably one of the biggest, best thing you can do outside of particle effects, which is the other biggest, best thing you can do in the game. So in this case, for example, I made it so that every time you pass through the um, stalag, Tight, the camera moves up and down. So like, now it just looked like, you know, previously it looked pretty cool that these things would crumble. Now it looks like you're causing an earthquake. And it makes the path look a little more treacherous. <laughs> I should also mention that uh, for death sequences, because usually this is disorienting, I like to do, um, I like to twist the camera uh, in its z-axis so that it, you know, you, you're doing uh, Dutch angles in both directions for a very short time. So for the camera shake, are you only shaking in one direction or two? Usually uh, in one direct, one axis. So in this case, like I'm moving just vertically here, and then if I hit that, that's twisting, that's doing the rotation thing. I will say that um, some people don't like camera shakes. I know Vlambeer, as an example, adds in a checkbox inside their uh, graphics options to turn off the screen shakes because it is a disorienting effect and it can cause 
you know, nausea, motion sickness, and so forth. So I would recommend making sure to add an option to remove them. But that said, as you can see, they, you know, they make the game that much more uh, interesting, that much more impactful in the way of the way you're playing the game, right? It adds, like, it adds action. Another thing I usually like to add is um, I, either partial or full screen uh, flashes. And also as bundled as part of this, I also added in a little bit of pause in the time. So as an example, a fairly common term is called hit pauses, which is what happens every time you hit an enemy. Let's say you're playing Legend of Zelda or something. Every time you hit an enemy, there's a small pause in time where it freezes and your brain kind of registers, it, it goes a little smoothly, but your brain kind of registers because it's that still frame of you hitting that enemy, your brain sort of registers that as a more impactful, as a more uh, powerful attack. So in this case, um, because there are no actual attacks going on, the hit pauses are kept to a relative minimum, but let's actually kind of see this happening in action. Remember, I also added in flashes here. And then death. So for the death sequence, I made it so that the entire screen turns, uh, turns red. So that you can actually see that, oh yeah, you clearly died. You know, you wanna, that's an important information. You don't, um, there's also the fact that I made the hit pause during when you actually collide into a stalactite and a stalagmite. Uh, comparably longer than the pauses that happens each time you go through uh, the gaps between the stalagmites and the stalactites. Uh, the, the reason largely being is that um, a lot of these are fairly disruptive um, effects, screen shapes being the, one of the worst ones, granted, but full screen, uh, full screen flashes are also pretty disruptive as well. So I usually do like to make sure that those are contextualized in such a way that it's clear what was actually being impacted. If it's you that's being impacted, I make it full screen. If it's the enemy that's being impacted, I usually make it the enemy added to win with a bunch of particle waves. And so forth. <coughs> yes, do you have any comments or questions, Jason? So it looked like as you were passing spikes, mm -hmm. you would flash them white. Right. And when you hit a spike, you flash the spikes red. It's and not the you... spike that turns red, the entire screen turns red. Can you show again? Yes. <coughs> So you're correct about this. I only flashed spikes white. So at least my line of thinking is if it impacts you, it takes up the full screen because that's something you need to know. If, it, if you hit an enemy, you know, I flash it on the enemy along with, again, lots more particle effects so that it's clear that it's not you who's being hurt or it's not you that needs to register that. It's the enemy that does. Um, I know the context is a little weird in that case, but at least for that, like, you know, with added animations and particle effects and so forth, I think it will add up to a point where it's like, oh yeah, that felt really good. Uh, normally, if it's like an actual action game, then I would make the hit pauses a lot longer. Again, this is, you know, a game about dodging things, so to me, that's not nearly, uh, the hit pauses are nearly, are not as important. So we got up to that far. Those are all the juices that, to me, make sense to add in. How can we add it, make this game a little more like, hey, I actually want to replay this game over and over again. An easy way to do that, you know, is to pull in a score right there. See, high score. Cool. Yeah, I got one. So yeah, easy stuff. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Everyone knows that that works. That makes you think like, oh yeah, I want to I wanna beat my last score in that case. So that, if it, so that it constantly encourages me to keep playing. But hey, what if you increase that one score to 1,000? So let's do that instead. Oh yeah. See that? That feels a lot better. Also, I added in the little gems to uh, make the game a little more difficult. Ooh. Yeah. yeah I got some. Yeah. 
So yeah, um, the tried and true increase the score by times times 10 to some x power is a perfectly viable method of making your game that much more juicy. Yes, it's a stupid trick. I am first to say that, but uh, you know, it works. It's the reason why in like, uh, unlike the Street Fighter or Street Fighter of the original kind, when you play like newer fighting games, they'll say like, oh, you hit a X number of combo and it'll say like, you also made 300 million damage. You also hit with 300 million ton damage points or something like that, which makes no sense whatsoever in physics, but it makes you feel that much better thinking like, oh man, Contextually, I did that much better than I did with just scoring one or two last time. Like I said, it's a silly thing, it's a silly psychological thing, but more number, uh, higher numbers often is a little more gratifying for a lot of people. And that is why you see a lot of games do it. So, so far, we added all these sort of things, but there's something missing. Heck, this was also missing in a Flappy Bird uh, game either. We want to make sure that, one, we show at least a high score up there, you know, that's always a good idea. But two, far more importantly, this is going to take a while, but far more importantly, as you're scoring higher, you want to make sure that the game gets a little harder. And the way I do it for this game is that the game actually gets ever so slightly faster each time you score. Ouch. So, you know, that's an easy way of making a game a little more, uh, increasing the replay value of a game because you want to make sure that they want to play it again. And now, now that I have this high score and I'm looking up there and I'm like, oh, that's not my score. I want to try that again. So, um, you know, displaying high score is always a good idea. Um, display, making it clear that your progress is being detected and the game is responding accordingly. It's making the game harder accordingly. It's always a good idea as well, because again, you want to make sure that, uh, one, they feel like they're getting better at the game, but two, far more importantly, that they're, they feel like they're making progress in the game. Achievements. So uh, for a lot of people, trying to beat your own high, school, high score is a great objective. For a lot of people, just giving them an actual goal is more effective with them. So you might as well try to cover both of those uh, audiences. In this case, I put in a little wavy flag on there that says, if you get up to 100,000 score, then you'll get a flag. So let's see if uh, my Flappy Bird skills let me do that. Oh, oops. <laughs> let's try that again. Incidentally, if anyone's curious, um, the little part, uh, the little crumbling things do not at all hit Flappy Fly in any way. I changed it so that their physics do not interact with the character. So you'll never be hit by the stray uh, dust particles, I guess. Come on. This is a speed run, I tell ya. Oh. Uh, Alright, what's supposed to happen is that the game tells you, hey, you got a flag, uh, along with the score. You're just gonna have to trust me on that. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not good enough. Uh, if you if you want to actually unlock that achievement, um, you can find this game on Game Jolt uh, or on itch.io. You can just search for "Make It Juicy," and I think it will show up on both of those. So uh, you can play it for yourself. You can also get the source code for yourself too, but uh, that's it. Beside the point. So up to this point, you know, we've added achievements, we added score, we added some really cool stuff, and we're like, man, this game is great, we're gonna ship it. And you're right, at this point, I would say, you can ship this game. But, here's a question to all of you. When do you think will be a good idea to actually take away those juice? Any ideas? If, if there's so much of it that it detracts from the main test of the game. 
Yes, agreed. What if it's too hard? Can well, we... as in, like, it doesn't kind of... If you add juice and then all of a sudden the player is not able to proceed. Right, because they're not able to see. So that, to me, make, uh, you want to make sure, that usually goes back to the player feedback, but yeah, yeah. you want to make sure that whatever juice you're adding in, it does not conflict with the objective of the player itself. The player itself needs to see themselves, right? I know that's a problem with a lot of my games, so I'm not, I'm not above that rule at all, but um, you're, you're both absolutely right. That's important as well. The one actually um, important moment on when you want to remove juice is any sort of serious moments that happen in the game, whether it be story points, or that kind of stuff. The reason being is that up to this point, like, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but this sort of like high score and adding achievements kind of makes it look very gamey, right? It's very silly in a way. Because like you have this objective, you know, Flappy Fly is now burning down and it's like, Burp, really? Well, what's going on there? So if you're trying to create like a narrative game, if you're trying to create a game that, you know, is like Twin Peaks, well, it'll go from Seri uh, it'll go from comedy to serious in a heartbeat, that kind of stuff. You want to make sure that um, you do it in such a way that the game slowly removes <coughs> its silliness during those more serious moments. So as an example, here is me thinking of a, a good time to start removing juice. And let's see what let's see if you can guess which juice I removed as a consequence of making the, making a more serious flappy fly game. All right, so you know, so far you have the music, everything it's all working out. You're still getting the score. You laugh, but this is supposed to be serious. <laughs> So, um, aside from it being very silly because it's very hard to make Flappy Fly actually serious, <laughs> what, does, so, um, what does matter is that you might have noticed as the, you know, I added in, so I'm just going to do this deliberately. Uh, I slowed down the time, but this is also happens to be a moment where I also took away the control from you. And not only that, but I also took away the music to kind of make you feel like, oh wait, this is a very serious moment, right? So now you have, this ser you have this story moment where you're like, oh, I don't have control in my current situation here, right? And this is actually me just kind of demonstrating a contrast between what it's like to go through that previous moment where you're like, you have all these stalactites and everything collapsing on you. And this, I mean, it has a lot of juice still in there. It has the sound effects, it has the animations, but it no longer has a particle effect on it, right? So you have this like significant contrast moment where you're like, this is at least the my intent with this is that you're you're taking you're interpreting this moment to be something a very different time, a very different mode of gameplay, where you're supposed to be interpreting the, these set of events in a completely different atmosphere, in a completely different setting. There's also a fact that I turned it into sepia tone to make it look like it's olden times, but that's beside the point. <laughs> also, you can't die here, but because dying makes it look gamey. And you know, like instead of showing you, oh, you scored 3,000 or anything like that, I had slowly faded the this is the end sequence. So that's basically it. 
that's my lesson as a whole. I want, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please raise your hand. Yes, please. So, a lot of this seems to be, uh, um, I, I can, it's, it's obviously very relevant to, to mobile games and, and probably for most PC games, but do you, do you feel that there's a significant difference when you try to, to, to add juice to the VR? Okay, yes, that's a good question. <clears throat> The end goal of every adding juice phenomenon, or the practice of adding juice, the end goal of adding juice is to let the play, uh, one, first important goal is to let the player know that they can interact with something, that they have control over a current situation. Two, is to make them feel like they have an absurd amount of control over the situation that they actually do. Um, <clears throat> obviously, a lot of these measures are there to add like a ton of more actions, and I can see that as an example, full screen flashes would not work on a VR scenario because that is a very disorienting thing. Screen shakes is not going to work either because they're going to be shaking their heads anyways. Uh, I believe freeze frames are not good either, although there are ways to make that work. So, like you know, your headset would still move but the entire world would, animation would pause for ever so slightly to indicate that it, some sort of thing uh, happened. So yes, there are ways to be able to add in juice that would actually add impact to a vr -like environment. It's just that you're limited to which ones that you can do. However, while I'd argue that for VR situations, what would be more important, especially since it's a relatively new field, is to make sure that things that you can interact with are clearly indicated as such that you can interact with it, which tends to be a relatively big problem, I would argue, for VR scenarios, because it's not like a 2D game where something all the way in the very far distance um, you know, is immediately visible on the screen. So as an example, uh, I provided, with, let's say like there's a button in the distance that you can use your touch controller like a zap, like a laser gun or a zapper, let's say, to say that you can push this button from distance, right? Now, you could say, like, when your gun points at it, it's like, you know, some sort of pop-up shows up and say, hey, you can push the button and interact with this button. Or, and or, to be fair, it's, it's not mutually exclusive, or you can flash that button you know, have it wiggle a lot each time you hover over it and say like, hey, you just did something right, right there. You're almost there, right? You're almost there on doing the one thing I want you to do. You, want, you can try to get it so that uh, you are bringing the attention of the player to tell them that they are doing the right thing. And I think that's where Juice will become more, Juice is most relevant in a VR situation. You want to make sure that anything that I added in there, whether it be sound effects, animations, um, you know, uh, encapsulated flashing, not full screen flashing, but encapsulated flashing, and every once in a while any sort of action where free springs is possible. I think those uh, would be useful in a VR environment when you're indicating the player they are doing the right thing. Or, alternatively, they are doing the wrong thing and you want to make sure they feel nauseated for doing so. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but something similar to the effect. So that is a good question, yes. <coughs> yes? Can you get examples of the like, narrative-based uh, <coughs> Sound effects, um, background music. Um, some games has this really subtle Thing. Okay, this will excuse me. Um, <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so let me get to this part. So notice I put a pause right there before I reveal what the next text is. Mm -hmm. That, I would argue, is a juice. Timing on when you're revealing text. Uh, some, huh? That makes sense. Yeah. Some games also allows you to add color to certain texts, like saying this is a, something that's really important you should highlight. As an example, the Zelda series likes to put in text messages where if it's red, then it's, a, it's an important clue. You should pay attention to it. Like, those is, I'd argue, a form of juice. Um, 
it's a little that one's a little weird um, <laughs> because it's not necessarily that you're adding control over the situation but something like yeah. that um, being able to control the scrolling speed by clicking or something like that I think is also very useful uh, other examples there are some really subtle ones that I know of that does this uh, so this is called parallaxing the fact that the background is moving slower than my character uh, some games when you hover your mouse around it will cause the background to shift a little bit as well so that the perspective will change that one is a good one uh, I believe um, there was a dinosaur dating game from RPI earlier. That mm -hmm. one has that effect, and it's actually quite effective at making it feel like the world has a little more depth in the game. Uh, I would also recommend adding in, like, maybe when you click on it, um, you know, a little bit of particles would happen, but that might be overkill for, you know, uh, a Rempi game, um, because that's usually not something I would personally add myself. Um, when you're making a choice between like yes or no or something, or like you made like a positive choice or a negative choice, if for whatever reason you want to tell the player that they are doing the right thing or they're doing the wrong thing, sound effects as well as change in facial expression of the character that you're seeing are a great way of giving that sort of information. So at least for me, the way I interpret juice as is you always want to give more contextual information to the player. More like, are they doing the right thing? Are they doing the wrong thing? How, if they're doing the right thing, how do you make that make a uh, right thing? How do you encourage them to do that right thing more often? So that's some, so in that sense, like any uh, plans that you want, any visual effects, animation, sound effects, that kind of stuff. Anything you want to add into that game to, um, I would argue you want to make sure that you focus it most on um, getting the player to do what you want them to do. Thanks. Yep. Also, the red shifting has kicked in. So, um, I know people on the stream, is people on the stream seeing the red shift? Please let us know in the comments. Yes, Jace. Uh, do you know about nine slicing sprites? I do know about nine slicing sprites. Are you asking why I'm not using it for this application? Yeah. It was before I had nine slicing sprites. <laughs> In fact, this is not even using the new GUI at all. It's using the old GUI. <coughs> so, not even old GUI. It's actually using game, uh, 3D game objects to click on these. So these are actually 3D colliders that I'm clicking on. What's the opposite of juice? <laughs> As a visual person, you'd like drying up your game. <laughs> I guess that would be the pop of scaled, clunky. I think the term juice is meant to be for juicy meat. So uh, dry oh, is yeah. one way of putting it, bland is another way of putting it. Juicy meat? I thought it was like a, an allusion to, or, uh, to drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that case, dry works as well. All right, moving on. Anyone else with any questions? We got a question coming in from Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have a dream logician. Do you want to read them? Yeah, you can read them. Okay. Uh, question number one. Related question. Can you recall any examples from other games you have played where you felt a particular instance of juice attracted from the experience? The question was. Uh, have you had any experience in games that you made where the juice has detracted from the experience? Um, yes. It depends on what the experience you're aiming for is. So I made a game called Through Oneself. And as a brilliant idea, I made it so that we're, uh, you can actually see... Um, all right, let me back up a bit. Excuse me. I should talk about Through Oneself first. So Through Oneself is a game where your character is a silhouette. You can't actually see her most of the time, but there is a second world that exists uh, that is revealed through her silhouette. And a huge portion of the game is making sure that you had the camera angles just right so that you can actually see where the character is and make the, make the movement decisions as necessary so that you can get to your objective. Because it is a major, because 
part of that game experience is about being able to find that character. When I added in these particle effects that would appear on the foot of the character and would sprout out all the time, that was interpreted as no, that was not a good idea. You're detracting from the main experience of the game, which is being able to find the character from the first place. So that was one thing where the juice was actively working against the objective of the game, of the core experience of the game, really. I think experience scores do that for some games. I'm sorry, what? Experience scores? Experience scores are like being an enemy and then you have to collect orbs to get experience points for it. I think that's a waste of time. Interesting. Um, that's, I do not disagree. Um, there was one other example I had in mind. Camera shakes are dangerous, as mentioned earlier. Uh, camera shakes and full screen flashes are super dangerous. Uh, they should be taken with care. Uh, generally speaking, so I always add them in in practically every game. Oh, okay, I don't always add them in. But generally speaking, I try to add them in as much as possible. But depending on how frequently they occur, I mentioned earlier that they are both very disorienting or causing epilepsy if it's full screen flashes. And if it's for um, any screen pauses, like it's, if you make them too long, it's very, very, very easy to make people think that the game broke. So those, depending on how you implement them, and generally speaking, depending on how frequently it happens, are very bad and they distract from the experience by effectively making you nauseous. Another obvious example is in VR context, a lot of those techniques I just mentioned earlier will not work because they'll disorient the player. Okay. I, I but you're, oh. What was there, what? <laughs> what are games that I played, not games that I've made? Okay, so I apparently misunderstood the question. What are games that I made where the ju or made? What are games that I played where the juice was not conducive to the experience of the game? Fair enough. Um, Actually, that is a good question. It's confession. It's been a while since I played a variety of games that I used to back in high school and college because being an adult is hard. <laughs> um, but let's see. That is a good question. Um, Some games tries to be helpful by, giving, by telling you that you should totally click this button by either animating them or flashing them. A lot of times, if I'm playing a game that has a lot of menus with a lot of buttons that are shaking and flashing, and like, I'm not wanting to do that action, I find that a distraction. Um, that is a hard problem to fix because it is a player problem usually, less so than an application problem. But nonetheless, like, if you seriously want to make sure that a player pushes the button at the right time or, you know, are trying to get into that action, you might as well disable the entire thing and make, force them to push that button because, like, that's my opinion, of course. Every game designer is going to talk different about this. Um, no, I'm thinking more like, say, Farmville, where they'll be like, oh, I want you to click on this uh, corn stalk and start planting them. And I'm like, no, I want to plant more cows in the ground, right? So um, 
That happens more when it's clear that there are more player choices and yet the game is trying to make the player do something else, right? So that one's a little weird. Um, and I, like I said, I know that depending on which game designer I'm talking about, I'm going to talk to, they're all gonna have different opinions and probably opposing opinions from mine as well. So it's not a hard or fast rule in that regards. Super can work well you, you can give sound effects that don't match what's going on in the screen at all. Hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and then I have one more question. Last question, I promise. Do you think the concept of juice is applicable to non digital games in any way? Um, yes. The aforementioned increase the score by 1,000 <laughs> is a very obvious way <laughs> of doing that. Uh, generally speaking, so analog games, whenever you start making an analog game in the beginning, at least I tend to do this. Um, you're often starting with very uh, abstract places. But uh, if you play, you know, the recent games, or, you know, if you play just any respectable board game, whether it be, you know, whether it be Monopoly, whether it be uh, Sorry, that kind of stuff, there's a clear context as to what story each of those board games, card games, analog games are trying to convey. They're trying to convey it with a very specific aesthetic. They're trying to convey it with a very specific gimmick in mind. And I think that is where Juice is definitely involved. Like, you want to make, uh, you know, if you're going to be playing a board game where, you know, you have these characters that are moving around, would it be more impactful if each of those characters had a profile image, had an actual bi bio or biography attached to them, a description. Yeah. So like, would you, would you feel uh, more in tune with that game if you, it's clear to you that you're supposed to be role playing this new character? And I personally think a lot of people will think so. Some games obviously it's, that's not a requirement and it makes more sense not to do so, but in a lot of games, you know, adding that characterization, as an example, goes a very, very long way in uh, adding to the experience of playing that board game. In regards to, like, you know, uh, let's say you flip over a card and some action occurs, you could say action, or you could say disaster, like, you know, adding impact to, adding impact to what just happened, is by you know changing the text such that it's contextualized to be much bigger than it really is from a game mechanical standpoint is like a fantastic way of adding more juice to it because again what you're trying to look for is you're trying to add con uh, you're trying to um, contextualize good and bad actions to the player in an easy to digest fashion if that makes sense Any other questions? That is, well, even though he promised there was this last question, he's asking about uh, butterfly effect. Does that count as a juicy? <laughs> oh, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> that sounds like a systems game mechanics thing and probably is out, well out of scope of this conversation. Is that the one? Nah, it's Jamie. So the butterfly effect, if anyone isn't aware, is the, I guess, theory slash philosophy slash question mark. Ooh, butterfly effect. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what he was talking about. Oh, no, never mind about that. The real butterfly effect is about flapping. Uh, would a flap of a butterfly cause... Uh, major effects on the climate due to, you know, yeah. um, due to the fact that the climate is affected by even the smallest changes that are made on this planet. 
Um, so the, my original interpretation was, you know, if a domino effect starts happening in the game, is that a juice related thing? And to me, that's like a no, not really. That strikes me as a game mechanics thing. If you're talking about um, until dawn, and it's really terrible boom butterfly effect that we go in, we go in depth in our podcast at Game Club. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah. No, that game added in what's called a butterfly effect, where if you make a dramatic choice, a lot of particle effects will appear on the screen, and characters will start acting as if that choice was major. Uh, as someone who prefers their story to be more subtle than that, that made me go like, why? Why did you have to tell me that this choice was significant? Um, so going back to Frederica asking the question, how do I make narrative games, you know, uh, juicy? There is a slippery slope. Uh, too much juice. Uh, so to pull it another way, um, too much action going on on a decision that you're making that makes it, at least for Until Dawn's case, very clear that it was meant to be a significant choice, especially when that game has a lot of other more minor choices that you can make, can be a detriment because it makes the experience a lot less subtle. It takes away a lot Actually, to pull it another way, I like to, I thought of it as distrusting the player. In the sense that, you know, why couldn't the player themselves, or as Jamie likes to pull it, why couldn't the player themselves put the significance of that choice, right? Um, if you're just telling them, oh, you made a huge and important choice, it's like, but, you know, I don't want to be told that. I want to be, I want to act in person or in a character of whatever that you want to do that makes you feel like um, you know you had some influence on the matter but you're not entirely sure how, how. like that mystery is always useful I think um, so there is that there is some places where I can take I take back some of my statements because personally there are, there are not what I would think would be good design choices for those narrative games. Yeah, Boom Butterfly Effect is a juice, without a question. It's a terrible juice. Um, it, it really, really, really makes the scenes, like a significant, you made a significant choice, uh, scenes look really goofy, because it's like, you know, you'll just be like, uh, some of the choices will be something as mundane as uh, maybe we should take the path to the left or maybe you should take the path to the right. And you're, you're like, all right, well, I'll, I'll give it a choice. I will take the path to the left. And suddenly the screen starts flashing, boom, 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 boom. You did it, you chose the, the left path. And I'm like, no, why? I know you would have done the same thing if I'd chosen the right path too. This doesn't help me. <laughs> So yeah, that there's, yes, as mentioned earlier, there are plenty of moments where taking away juice is actually a better decision. Yeah. Uh, it's, Jamie, Jamie said, like, butterfly juice is the worst, and huh? then kids are crying in the Butterfly, butterfly mm -hmm. effect? Butterfly juice. <laughs> <laughs> he splashed the two terms together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he likes beetle juice. He loves Beetlejuice. Yeah! Nineties slash eighties kids cartoon unite. The movie was in the eighties, the cartoon was early nineties. I see. The, nine, the cartoons are the one I remember the most ironically, not the movie. Uh, it, it was a little bit more kid appropriate. <laughs> Any other questions?
All right. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so.